tonight we're fortunate enough that we're actually going to hear from Charlotte Smallwood Cook because I did have the privilege in 2011 to take her oral and video biography. And uh, she is a pistol, as uh, Judge Rosenblatt said. So rather than me tell you her story, um, uh, I'm going to give you the br very brief skeletal outline of who Charlotte was, and then I'm gonna let her tell you a few stories um, on her own, because I think that's the way you can really get the true measure of this extraordinary woman. And she was extraordinary in so many ways. Um, and yes, until her death, she drank a vodka gimlet for lunch every single day. <laughs> uh, Charlotte was born on January 24th, 1923 in Union Springs. That's on Cayuga Lake. Uh, she grew up there. She spent her entire life there before she moved back to, uh, or she moved to Warsaw, New York. Her father was a country doctor and her mom was a nurse. Uh, paradoxically, her father was always encouraging Charlotte to think outside the box and do things that women characteristically weren't allowed or for whatever reason did not do. Her mother, on the other hand, told Charlotte that uh, she should go to school and do the things that women were supposed to do, like be a nurse, a teacher, or a secretary. And when Charlotte, as you'll hear in a minute, um, decided to become a lawyer, that was scandalous to her mother and encouraged by her father. Such was life back in the 1930s. Uh, Charlotte attended the Cornell uh, University in undergraduate program. And then in her second year, because money was getting tight, she persuaded the school to allow her to do a joint degree program um, so that she could get her undergraduate and her law degree. At that time, she met her future husband, Ned Smallwood, who was a law student there. And um, if you do have occasion to watch the entire biography, it's quite an interesting story how she met Ned, who was a blind law student at the time. And, and they fell in love, and Ned uh, graduated before Charlotte and moved to New York, where he had a, um, an offer from Donovan Leisure. So Charlotte packed up and went with him transferred to Columbia Law School where she graduated um, in 1946. Um, at, right after she moved to New York, or right after she graduated from Columbia, she and Ned moved back to Ned's hometown of Warsaw where Charlotte practiced law continuously until the age of 89. And when I say continuously, I mean that. She was in her office every single day, Monday through Friday and often weekends until she was 89. She had a 65-year career. And if you, someone was telling this story earlier, if you go to uh, anyone who went, oh, I think it was Judge Paradato's husband said anytime he went to go to pick a jury against Charlotte in uh, Wyoming County, she couldn't pick a jury because every juror had been represented by Charlotte <laughs> at one time or another. So such was, such was Charlotte. Well, in 1949, at the ripe old age of 26, Charlotte became the first female district attorney in New York State after practicing a total of two years. Uh, it gives you an idea of who Charlotte was because at the time there had never been a woman who elected a district attorney, and you can imagine the obstacles uh, that she had to overcome. Uh, Charlotte was also the first woman to win a capital murder case. Um, in New York State, um, and uh, she was the first woman in 40 years in Wyoming County to even prosecute one. So you're going to hear a little bit about that case from Charlotte herself later. Ned, unfortunately, died suddenly in 1952, um, and that was the last year of Charlotte's term. As district attorney, she had two children at the time, and she decided that she had to take care of them and continue to practice law, and she could not do that while she was a district attorney. So she did not um, run for re-election, but did, as I say, continue on for 65 years. By the way, I asked her, why did you continue to practice full-time until you're 89? She says, well, I just got too old to retire. <laughs> um, but Charlotte, after she, uh, she decided not to run for re-election, uh, as I say, did continue to practice, but she stayed active 
very active. She became the chairwoman of the Wyoming County Republican Committee. She became a delegate to the New York State uh, Bar Association, was one of the first two women elected as a fellow, interestingly enough on that title, elected a fellow of the American College of Trial Lawyers. Uh, she retired in 2012, as I say, and she, uh, she died on January 26, 2013, at the age of 90. But as I said, this is just a skeletal outline of who Charlotte was. Um, obviously, none of us tonight could give you the full measure of what these women did or who they were. But if we can perhaps provoke an interest in these people, there's material that you can read well above and beyond what we're presenting you, and I commend to you the, the uh, two-hour interview and audio uh, biography that I did of Charlotte. Um, she was still active and practicing when I did that interview, and I tried to walk her through, um, again, I only had two hours, but I tried to walk her through the highlights of her life. So um, I thought it would be appropriate for Charlotte to tell you um, how she made the decision to become a lawyer, because it's a decision she made early on in her life. And here's her, here's her recollection of how that decision was made. When I was in seventh grade or eighth grade, the, we had a young principal at school who had a, unwittingly, perhaps, a great influence on me because he, I was uh, sitting in class, in a classroom, and he came down and he said, Miss Light, uh, I am in a guidance course at Cornell. And uh, he said, what do, you, do you have any idea what you would like to do when you grow up? And I said, no, I mean, whoever thought, no one thought what they were going to do when they grew up. <laughs> so he said, well, I've looked at your marks, and I think you would be a good lawyer. And I said, oh, and he went away. And that could have been the last of it, but uh, no one knew what a lawyer was. There was no, there were no lawyers that were famous. There was, Portia was about the only one that I'd ever read about. Mm -hmm. And uh, we talked about it after school or in lunch. And I said, do you know what a lawyer is? And they didn't know, but they said, there is one in town. I said, what does he do? They all conferred and said, he goes to Ithaca every day. <laughs> and so that's all we knew about lawyers. But on the way home, I always took books because I love to study. And on the way home, I'm walking down this big, broad walk, and the kids, as usual, say, Hey, what are you taking books home for, Charlotte? You don't need to take books home. What are you taking books home for? And I said, Because I'm going to be a lawyer. And they never tease me again. <laughs> so Charlotte did become a lawyer. As I mentioned, she graduated from Columbia. And uh, two years after, she decided to run for district attorney. And the fact that no other woman had ever been elected as a district attorney didn't bother Charlotte in the slightest, but it sure annoyed a lot of other folks. Um, so here in Charlotte's own words is why she decided to run that race in 1949 and how she had to fight the local political machine to get started. But, but uh, Sheriff, I, was try I tried a case and the Sheriff told me while I was trying, and he said, you'd be a good DA one day, someday. And I said, thank you. And I went home and told Ned, and he said, well, I wonder how you do that. I said, let's look it up. So we looked it up. And then we started talking, or he started talking to other lawyers and about how you'd go about it. And uh, one of the lawyers we knew well said, you can't run for d dog catcher if you don't get approval of the county chairman, it was Jim Nash, and he's been county chairman 40 years. <clears throat> he sort of decides who's going to do what. So I said, okay, well, then Ned said, why don't you call him up, go down and see him. So I did. I called him up, went down, went into his house, and we sat and talked, and, and he said, well, now, what can I do for you? I said, well, I uh, am thinking of running for district attorney. Oh, no, he said, you don't want to do that. I said, well, why not? Well, he said, there's no job for a woman. Well, if you were a woman and got raped, would you rather be 
have a have a prosecution by a district attorney or or who was a man or a woman well he said i don't know about that but it's language is bad you don't want to hear all that bad language and i said well i really don't know it so i guess it won't bother me will it and he said, well, you can't do it. We can't let you. I'll tell you what. We'll give you jobs or two jobs that'll pay a lot more than that district attorney job. Well, I said, I don't really want the money. I just am interested in running for district attorney. And I've checked it. Ned and I have read how you do it. And all you need is to get 500 signatures of people registered as Republicans and file them with the... Uh, the um, officials and then you run. Well, he said, you won't get that far. Nobody will dare sign your petition. We'll see to that. And I said, you will? And he said, oh, yes. He said, they won't dare sign your petition. I said, well, I stood up and said, well, thank you for your interview and talking to me and we'll see whether we're sinking a battleship or launching one. And, and uh, I left. And then I found out that he was partly right. A lot of people didn't even want to talk to me on the street, but they would say, come to my house, <laughs> and I'll talk to you at my house. So that was the beginning of Charlotte's political career, needless to say, no woman was supposed to be district attorney, and certainly not with Chairman Nash. Um, but her campaign, obviously, this woman was not deterred by anything. Uh, her campaign was not only unprecedented, but it was unorthodox, to say the least. Um, I asked Charlotte who uh, her opponent was, and um, Charlotte's, I, I, just, it, it, I just wish everyone could have gotten to meet her. But she looked at me and she said, well, I had to run against that hapless fellow, <laughs> Glenn Charles. And I said, really, I, you know, why, why was he hapless? Well, he's a nice man, but he never really wanted to become a lawyer. His parents wanted him to become a lawyer. But he had a spiffy secretary who did all his work. <laughs> so the hapless Mr. Charles was going to be confronted with the anything but hapless Charlotte Smallwood Cook. But Mr. Charles did have many unearned advantages, as you might imagine, not the least of which was he was a man. And in a, in a man's world and in a man's political machine in a town that, uh, or a county that had never even considered a woman holding such an office. Um, because she was a woman, most of the newspapers in the county refused to publish even her political ads. Imagine that, a newspaper not taking money for political ads. Is Congressman Higgins here yet? Yes, he is. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, she had to do most of the legwork herself because, of course, Chairman Nash and the Republican Party weren't going to help her. Well, Charlotte dispatched both Mr. Nash and the hapless uh, Glenn Charles, um, winning the Republican line, but that, of course, was only the beginning. The, the, she then had to deal with her Democrat opponent. Never an easy task, because this was, in Charlotte's words, this guy was a flaming Irishman <laughs> named Francis Kelly, who had plenty of dirty tricks that, uh, that Charlotte had to deal with. Um, Charlotte discusses one of those examples. The Democrats decided to put out at all the bars that the reason that I was running for district attorney was that I wanted to dry up Wyoming County. That was my aim in life. <clears throat> because uh, we were having the vote, the dry vote that year, which was comes up, I think, every 10 years or it did at that time, mm -hmm. as to whether or not uh, alcohol could be sold in the county. And so Ned and I talked about it, and Ned said, you know, you've got to counteract that. And I said, well, I just can't go and say that I take an occasional drink. And he said, no, you can't do that. So he thought and thought, and he said, what you have to do, Charlotte, is to go to every bar in Wyoming County and sit with the bartender for a one drink. You don't have to drink the whole drink but order a drink from the bartender, introduce yourself, and tell them you're running for district attorney. And then shake hands and leave. And it was, it was I think I started in Attica. And Attica had 15 bars 
I think. It was just terrible. <laughs> and if you just take a little sip of beer, which I didn't like to begin with, <laughs> if you just take a little sip of it, and then you take another little sip, and after the 14th bar, you think maybe this is time to go home. <laughs> but that's what I did. And so they uh, didn't make any progress on that. But it did introduce me to a lot of bartenders. And I assume they spread the word. Oh, yes. So they, they would say, oh, she's not, she's not against alcohol. She's not against that. She's been in here. She was in here the other day and had a beer. <laughs> Tenacious and wise. Uh, Charlotte was motivated at that point in time, obviously. Um, she continued on with her campaign. She won the general election by a landslide, 65 percent of the vote, and here in her own words is one of the reasons why that happened. Well, I'll tell you that the, during the, the Republican nomination, I had a lady afterwards tell me that it was a gal from Wyoming, and she had done some sewing for me. And she said, you know, Charlotte, my husband, when it came nomination day, refused to take me to the polls. She, he said, I have voted all my life as a Republican but I'd vote for a yellow dog before I'd vote for a woman. And she says, you know, I called up and I got somebody else to take me to the polls and I voted for you. And then she said, when you got nominated when you, and you ran in the election, my husband said, he was 96, she, he said, I voted all my life as a Republican but I'd rather vote for a woman than a yellow, than a Democrat. <laughs> and so he had to go and take her to the polls, and he had to vote for me. It was, uh, she laughed, so. The old coot, she said. Well, as I mentioned before, <clears throat> Charlotte really had a, an astonishing array of cases that she handled as a district attorney being in a, in a rural county. Uh, the one that she seemed to to enjoy speaking about most, though, was the capital murder case that I mentioned before. And um, uh, we obviously go into more depth in, in the full interview, but I thought um, some of her memories of that case might be interesting to you, um, particularly given uh, Charlotte's penchant for storytelling. I got a call at 7 o'clock, 6 o'clock in the morning that uh, from the sheriff, and he said, uh, get ready, we've got to go, a man is, a woman has been murdered down an arcade. I'll pick you up in 10 minutes. By the way, how many people were in the district attorney's office at the time? Me. <laughs> okay, go ahead. So he said, get dressed, I'll pick you up in 10 minutes. And so I rushed and got dressed. First of all, I asked him where, who was it? And he, when he told me, I said, I'll be right ready, because this guy had tried to kill his wife or had seemed to try to kill his wife accidentally the year before by shooting down to the floor rather near her. And so when he said who it was, I said, OK. So we went over right away. And then we looked all through the place. There was nobody. Well, he looked, he looked first, and I trailed after him. And he carried, he had his hand on his gun all the way. When we got through, I said, you don't have any gun in that pocket, do you? know, he said, I don't have a gun. <laughs> oh, no wonder I was so brave. Well, they eventually found that defendant, and uh, the sheriff uh, grabbed him and brought him back, actually, to the scene of the murder. Interesting way to handle a prosecution. Uh, and Charlotte took his statement, actually, at the scene of the murder and was able to determine what happened, and, and she told me, um, how this whole thing came about in her own uh, business-like fashion. I think, well, what happened was he said that night she said she wanted a divorce, and he was not going to have a divorce. <clears throat> so uh, <coughs> the brother stood in the way, and he let him have it. When she went and got her keys and her coat, she had them in her hand when she was killed. And she came out of the door, and he killed her, and she went down, and there she was. Wow. Did you get the murder one conviction? Yes, we did. What happened to him? He was electrocuted.
Now, Charlotte, interestingly, in that case, her term as district attorney was done in 1952, but the new incoming district attorney asked her to handle the appeal of that case at the Court of Appeals um, in 1953, which she did, and, and she won. Uh, later in her career, Charlotte was a very strong voice for upstate New York and the legal, legal community. She recalled one story uh, when there was a plot, mostly of downstate um, elected leaders, who were trying to take away the right to elect state court judges. And Charlotte was actually a delegate at that, um, um, at that convention, and she described to me how that all played out and how she was instrumental in stopping the, uh, the effort to, um, to take away the right to elect judges, state court judges. I was also a thorn in the side of the, the bar because I was on a committee that was to study the question of whether all judges in New York State of every kind and ilk should be nominated instead of elected. And I think Western New York and Central New York and upstate New York did not like the idea. So we had many, many meetings. And wherever the meeting was, I decided I would go, whatever it cost. And so they would have a meeting in New York City, take a plane. I might be a little late, but I'd be there. And they began to talk about how they were going to get this vote, accomplish the vote, in front of me. Um, and I would think, now I see how this is, these, these things are managed. You know, well, just persuade, persuade him, you delegate, persuade him do it, that he has other business that day. Or, you know, uh, couldn't, he, or couldn't, when, couldn't he have a wedding and that? You know, all these things. Well, now he owes me a favor. We'll do him. You know, I sat there and listened, and we had a meeting in, at the governor's office, and the man who was running the governor, uh, his deputy, talked and they all said how, how easy it was going to be, they were going to do this and that. And when they got ready, I said, I should say something. I said, upstate New York will never, will never give up the right to elect judges that they have. They never will. Because they know who, who was a judge and who's a good judge. And uh, he was quite taken aback and they were all pretty upset with me. And I. I said, well, you know how I stood. I stood the same way. So they never did get the thing passed. <laughs> Another victory for Charlotte. Um, at the end of my interview, I asked Charlotte if she had some words of advice for young lawyers and, and, and women in particular. And uh, Charlotte shared the following. Well, I believe that the, what I would suggest is that everyone try to do what they can do well and what they like to do. It's not always possible. I would also like to suggest that they respect other people because everyone, everyone has a good and they also have depths that you don't know of, that you have not thought about. Now to the world, I would say the most important thing in your life is your family. Uh, the second thing I would say is that you have to be true to yourself. My mother's famous quotation, which is I can't even quote it, was uh, if you're true to yourself, you can't be false to anyone else. And uh, I think that's true. So that is the measure of Charlotte Smallwood Cook. She was a woman who never she didn't complain, she didn't make excuses, she just put her nose to the grindstone, she overcame these obstacles like all these other women had done, and you can see what a remarkable person uh, she is, and particularly her attitude on life, the get it done attitude that so many, so many of these women have shown, which is why we've progressed from dusting furniture to to, to where we are today. But unfortunately, you know, this is just a brief glimpse into Charlotte's life. Um, that's the unfortunate part. The fortunate part is that we do have two hours of her um, discussing some of these issues and some other issues 
as well. And I hope that, that this will at least give you the introduction, inspire you to, to look a little further into Charlotte's life. Uh, she was a m remarkable woman and an inspiration to all of the people she practiced with and the people around her. And hopefully she will continue to be an inspiration, uh, not only to those in the legal profession, uh, but to women in all areas of society where opportunities have been for so long denied to them. So I hope you enjoyed hearing about Charlotte as much as I enjoyed talking to her. Thank you.